Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you all for coming um, to our webinar this afternoon on um, capital gains and losses. We thought that um, this would be an opportunity to help some of you go through um, what the rules currently are and what the rules potentially could be um, starting in 2020, 2021. So our agenda for today is, um, I'm here with Joe, by the way, everyone. Hi, everyone. Our agenda is, uh, what are capital assets? We'll go through that. Calculating your capital gain, discussing what's meant by a holding period, go through the current capital gain rates, um, give you some examples on calculating um, the tax that would be, um, you'd be looking at on a capital gain, and then, you know, helping you decide whether, you know, now or next year is, is the um, decision for you. And then we'll open it up to some questions. Um, so basically a capital asset in its most basic sense is something that makes you money. Um, so for a business, this is your property, your plant, your equipment, um, almost everything. You know, if you have a piece of machinery, if you have a piece of land, a capital asset to the business. Um, for individuals, it gets a little different. Um, it's pretty much homes and still land. Um, piece of collectibles, you know, if you have any art or artifacts, um, stocks and investment properties, those things are what would get you capital asset treatment, um, <coughs> bless you, which is uh, preferential to other ordinary income assets. Uh, so when you calculate your capital gain rate, the first thing you need to do is know what your basis in the property is. Um, and for that, it's the purchase price plus any purchasing costs plus any improvements that you've made in the property, and that's your basis. Um, so improvements, it's things that make it better. It's not necessarily um, maintenance items. You know, if you paint a building, that doesn't really count. But if you were to install an air conditioner on the building, that would increase your basis. Uh, and then when you're going to sell the building, um, or any asset really, it, what you're going to do is you're going to look at the gross selling price. Um, then you're going to look at the cost of the sale. And that's your net selling price that you're going to start to look at. You're going to subtract out your basis, and that's your gain. Um, for people that are selling a home, there is a home exclusion, and we'll show you an example of that at the end. Um, but that's the cap the gain that you'd be looking at, and then you decide, is it a capital gain, on, depending on what the asset is? And then uh, depending on the holding period, that would confirm, determine the rate. Uh, so holding periods, there's either short-term gains or there's long-term gains. It's the same with losses, but the rule is that you need to own own it for more than a year for it to be a long-term gain. Um, but to do this, what you do is you ignore the purchase date and you start counting on the date after. So in our example, we said if you purchase stock on January 1st of 2020, um, and then if you sold it on December 31st of 2025, that's almost five years later, you know, full five years, it's definitely long-term. Uh, let's say you needed to sell it on April 15th to pay off your taxes, it's short-term. Now, if you sold it exactly one year later on January 1st of 2021, it's still short term because you haven't had that year and a day feature. Um, so if you sell on January 2nd of 2021, then it becomes a long-term asset. Um, so for current capital gain rates for businesses, um, depending if you're a C-Corp, it's no special rate, no preferential. Um, capital gains are treated as ordinary income because there is no multiple classes, no preferential rates, um, and everything's taxed at 21%. Partnerships and S-Corps, it flows through and it's taxed at the owner's rates. Um, so for individuals, you know, if it's a short-term holding period, it's ordinary marginal tax rate for gains. Um, short-term and then long-term, it's either 0%, 15%, 20%, 20%, or 28%. 28% is only for collectibles. And then, but if you make over $250,000, there is a 3.8% surcharge from the Affordable Care Act. Um, so basically that 20% bracket is 23.8% bracket, 15, it could be 15% or 18.8%, um, and it depends. And then as I said, exemptions are available for the sale of your home. Uh, to calculate your tax on capital gains, what you're gonna do is uh, you'll find where income falls depending on your filing status. So for a single person, if you make up less than $40,000, you're gonna pay zero capital gains tax. And what they do is when we say your income, it's your taxable income at the end of the year. So that's all of your W-2 income, all of your interest, all of your dividends, all of your capital gains, 
less any deductions that you take, whether you take the itemized or the standard deduction. And then you're gonna, and then your qualified business deduction, uh, your QBI deduction, I'm sorry, then that taxable income at the bottom of your 1040 on page one, that's the rate you use. So if you have $39,999, you're a single filer, you're not gonna pay any capital gains. Uh, if you have $40,002, you're gonna pay the 15% tax bracket on your capital gain. Um, Short-term gains, they're taxed to your ordinary rate, uh, marginal income. Um, it's, you know, if you have any questions, we can always help you when we're doing your tax return, we can tell you what that is. And basically what that is, is every dollar after what you've already made is taxed at this amount. Uh, losses go to offset your gains your gains and it's limited the amount you can take three thousand dollars a year over your gains so if you have ten thousand dollars of losses and five thousand dollars of gains you're not going to declare any gains for the year you're going to take three thousand dollars as a deduction and then you have two thousand dollars to carry forward to the next year and use it then uh, so here we have two examples so let's say you sell your second home on nantucket for two million and fifty thousand dollars um, then you purchased, you purchased it in 1997 for 800,000, you recently renovated it, uh, put $200,000 into it, selling expenses were 50,000, assume that you're married, you have no other income, and you've not moved within the last few years, and that'll become apparent in the next slide. Uh, so since this is your second home, you don't get any exclusion. Uh, so assuming that this happens in 2020 with the current capital gains rates, you'd be looking at the gross sale price of $2,050,000 then you'd be taking away your selling expenses of 50,000. Gives you a net selling price of 2 million, less your basis, uh, that was your purchase price of 800,000, less your improvements of 200,000. You're looking at a million dollar gain at 23.8%. You're looking at $238,000 in taxes. Um, if this happened in 2021, and the reason we point this out is that um, there's been a lot of discussion from presumed, presumptive President-elect Biden that he's gonna, if you make over a million dollars, that there's no more preferential tax gains rate, um, which means that this would actually be a 39.7% rate if he gets what he wants, plus 3.8% Medicare surcharge, uh, bringing you basically up to a 43.5% tax rate. Um, so if your gross sale price is the same, your gain, you know, we followed all the way through, your gain is still $1 million, but now you're going to pay $435,000 in capital gains. Um, so this is where we were talking about that. Do you do it now or do you do it later? Um, now, if we want to look at the primary residence exclusion, um, basically what that means is if you're a single filer or you're married filing separately, you're going to get a $250,000 exclusion of that gain. Uh, married filing joint filers, they get $500,000. And basically that just takes it right off the gain. Um, so almost as if you're increasing your basis. Conceptually, it's really not, but it works out to be the same. Um, the requirements for this is that in the last five years, in total, you've lived there for two of them, and you haven't used the exclusion in the last two years. Um, so if we follow this through, we still have two million fifty thousand dollars of selling price, fifty thousand dollars of selling costs for a net selling price of two million. Um, we have eight hundred thousand dollars of purchase basis, two hundred thousand dollars of improvement basis. We have a tentative gain of a million. Um, then we have a $500,000 exclusion um, to leave us with a $500,000 gain in 2020. This would leave us with a $119,000 capital gains tax. Um, if we did that in 2021 with the presumed increase, uh, you wouldn't hit, now you wouldn't hit the 43.5% bracket because you're under a million. So you would still get the 20% bracket with 3.8% surcharge actually remain the same. Um, for those of you who have um, been around a little bit, this, this primary residence um, exclusion superseded the old rules, which are actually very old, but many of us still believe they exist because it's not like we sell our homes, our primary residence every so often. Um, those rules used to be as long as whatever gain you made in your primary residence, as long as you bought a home greater than that gain, there was no gain. So you could automatically roll your gain over into your new home. 
Those rules have gone. They've been gone for a long time. And these are indeed the current rules. So any gain you have on your residence, it's taxable if you're single and it's above 250 or if you're married and it's above $500,000. This is the only applicable rule. Um, so this really comes to, should you sell it now or should you sell it next year? You know, if your income is extremely high this year and you don't want to, if you do in, you know, next year you won't have much income, then maybe it's something you do. Otherwise, you might want to consider speeding up the sale, especially if you had already planned to do the sale, um, and it's a good time. Yeah. It's also a good time to talk with your financial planners about loss harvesting. Um, for 2021 um, and maybe take some gains off the table uh, depending on your income in 2020. And you know there is still time to do the sort of planning. Um, so those of you who are on a fixed income, retired, whatnot, it's a good opportunity to um, you know, take a look at your portfolios and, and have some good planning from, tax, from a tax perspective. Does anybody have any questions? Hi, can you hear me? Yes. So I have a, this is a Marja Kitsuki. Uh, I have a question. Um, in my primary residence, we also have a rental unit. So do we get the 500,000 exclusion on the non-rental portion? Yes. Okay. That, that It's a little tricky though, Maja. So if, if you're planning on doing that, let's run some numbers for you um, because when your primary residence is partly investment property, um, it looks, it can be a little daunting. Right, and we're not selling this year, but we are thinking next year. Okay. The other question I have is um, when you're calculating your basis, um, we've owned this home for a very long time. So we've put a lot of money and we've put some money into repairs, but we've taken the depreciation every year. So can that's basically, you don't have any, you can't claim any improvements. Is, am I assuming that correct? That would be double dipping. Anything that you've depreciated over the few past, however many years is gone from your basis. Um, so let's say you purchased the home for a hundred thousand. Um, you've fully depreciated the rental half. So, uh, and 50% of it was rental, I should say. So you have $50,000 of personal basis, $50,000 of that rental basis. Then over the last 29 and a half years, you've depreciated the whole rental portion. You're stuck with $0 in basis on the rental portion. I think we depreciated the cost of the house. So I'm not sure that would even be I'm not sure how that works. So if you depreciated the cost over years, you, you don't have a cost basis. Correct. Right. Oh boy. Okay. <laughs> but but let's, you know, for example, let's say you bought the house for a hundred thousand dollars and over the years you've made improvements to the house and worse, you know, major improvements like a new roof, we would split that 50-50. But let's say you just um, improved the apartment and you redid the whole thing and that cost you 50, <coughs> excuse me, $50,000. That would be allocated just to the apartment. Okay. And then the, the, the depreciation period would be over 27 and a half years. So if you've owned the property or any improvements were done 27 and a half years ago, then yes, there's no basis. Okay. Thank you. Sure. All right.
right, so it looks like there's no other questions. Um, thank you all again for joining us this afternoon. If you do, in fact, have other questions, um, you know, that, that you'd rather speak to us privately, um, feel free to email us or give us a call. We're happy to help. And um, next week, we will not have a webinar. We're, we, we potentially may um, video one so that you all can um, watch it, watch it on Thanksgiving. <laughs> <laughs> But if not, uh, wishing everyone a very safe and healthy and peaceful um, Thanksgiving holiday next week. Thank you. Thank you all. Have a great Thanksgiving. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.